I can get you to... This is the story, the fantastically true story, of Herbert A. Philbrick, who for nine frightening years did lead three lives. Average citizen, high-level member of the Communist Party, and counter-spy for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. For obvious reasons, the names, dates, and places have been changed, but the story is based on fact. The Communists will go to any extreme to destroy a potential anti-Communist force. a jolly life who by the rail runs down and leaves his business and his wife and all the din of town. The poet forgot one thing. If comrade Steve wants you, he can by the rail run down too on the double. Special assignment, comrade. For the next two weeks, do not contact party headquarters. What's the assignment? New citizens committee. A bunch of neighborhood businessmen who think they have a social conscience. They're uh, anti-graft, anti-evil, anti-communist. For all sorts of reforms, playgrounds, all that junk. Regular 100% American line of hokum. Where do I come in? As a member of the committee in very good standing. Three other comrades will join with you. Four of you shouldn't have any trouble in taking over. How big's the committee? 25, 30 active members, maybe a few more. Twice that number inactive. Four of us won't have any trouble taking over? It's been done before, comrade. You'll get complete instructions at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Address is 1211 8th Street. It's a real estate office. Don't bother feeling sorry for yourself, Philbrick. All you can catch here is fish. Fats, in assuming command of the run-of-the-mill citizen organized committee, there are two basic rules to follow. One, act like every other member of the committee. And two, act often. Kindly repeat my words. Comrade Steve. One, act like every other member of the committee. Two, act often. Correct. Comrade Eileen. One, act like every other member of the committee. Two, act often. Comrade Walter. One, act like every other member of the committee. Two, act often. Comrade Walter. One, act like every other member of the committee. Two, act often. Comrade Herb. One, act like every other member of the committee. Two, act often. Comrade Fred. One, act like every other member of the committee. Two, act often. Thank you, comrade. Sometimes the most elementary teaching techniques are the most effective. Comrades, we are the compact... The communist briefing session leaves nothing to the imagination, assumes no foregone conclusions, allows no margin for error. Every detail is spelled out. The comrade's design is clear-cut. They use committees, clubs, associations, any and every form of public or semi-public organization for one prime purpose. The voice of communism is to fall on the public ear disguised as the voice of the people. That's the principal objective. Now, comrades, so much for basic groundwork. Now, some specifics. First, the diamond seating arrangement. Comrades, Assume this to be the committee meeting hall. This, the stage. Here, the audience. Now, Comrade Herb will sit in this general area. Comrade Eileen to the right, Comrade Walter to the left, Comrade Fred to the rear. Thus, when we vote by show of hands or by voice, when we move or second movements, when we discuss, when we applaud, or when we censor, 
it is not the effect of the compact minority, but as it were, the expanded majority. Opinions will seem to come from north, south, east, west, front, back, right, left. The diamond seating arrangement, comrades, with one more thing, the pivot man, comrade Steve. He will be seated in this general vicinity. He will direct the operation. He will never take the floor himself. He is the only one who may make contact with you. The rest of you are to neither recognize or converse with each other. Remember, you are four strangers. The effect of the diamond seating arrangements, comrades, is overwhelming. Our ideas appear to be the unanimous ideas of the entire membership. Are there any questions about the diamond seating arrangement? Yeah. Isn't it possible that the committee we're trying to take over already has a fixed seating arrangement? <laughs> no, comrade. No, it is not possible. You see, comrade, the committee we are going to join has not yet had its first meeting. <laughs> we, we get up before the early bird, huh? Exactly. Now, comrades, most of you will be contacted by the committee organizers within a few days. Be careful not to arouse suspicion by seeming too anxious to cooperate. Americans are joiners, but they are reluctant on first contact. They are so busy. Comrade Herb, you in particular be careful. The leader of the committee, no doubt, will approach you directly. Now, don't underestimate him, comrade. By bourgeois standards, he is a fairly intelligent man. Oh, and incidentally, comrade, he happens to be your next-door neighbor and, I believe, close acquaintance. Ed Hughes? A fortunate coincidence, eh, comrade? Yeah. Our meeting will take place again within the next few days. Comrades, you may leave one at a time. Sweet setup, isn't it, Philbrick? If you do what the party wants, you double-cross your next-door neighbor. If you don't, you double-cross everything else you're trying to do. Oh, what's the use in crying to yourself? Try the FBI. They got broad shoulders. Too. Body repair work, car painting, all that kind of thing. Built it up from a one-pump station in five years. Didn't go to his head, though. Still thinks about himself last and other people first. <laughs> you talk about the brotherhood of man, there's a guy that really works at it. Sounds like quite a guy. Yes. If I louse him up, I'm really a heel. I see what you mean. Anderson, I just can't do it to him. Of course not. There's just one thing, Herb. If you don't do it to him, someone else will. Someone who's a communist 24 hours a day. Someone who doesn't have a going agreement with the FBI. You thought about that? I guess I just haven't got any choice. I'll see you.
me out of it, Herb. We've been over the fence neighbors too long. I know what you stand for, and I know what you stand against. And I know you're the kind of man we need if this committee is to mean anything at all. Now, well, those are nice words, Ed. But honest, I don't even know how far behind I am at the office. Good. I don't like a worrier. Really, Ed, I, I just, I just haven't, haven't got the time. Now, doesn't it ever worry you, never catching up with things, working late, night after night? Not a chance, Herb. Too many more important things to bother me. I can't worry about working late when so many men are just worried about working, period. Well, what do you say? Well, I say, okay, let's work late nights together. Good. Here's your membership card, and the first meeting is Sunday afternoon at 3.30. Let's go, Herb. typed on here already. You were pretty sure of yourself, weren't you? No, I'm sure of you. Next stop, 8th Street. You're slipping, comrade. I was alone a full five seconds. After the welcoming speech by Ed Hughes, hearty applause will come from Comrade Walter and Comrade Eileen. Originate the applause if possible. It will give you some stature in the eyes of your fellow members. The second part of the meeting is vital to us, the election of officers. Naturally, Ed Hughes will be elected chairman of the committee. This leaves the officers of vice chairman, secretary, treasurer, and the very subcommittee heads. For our specific purpose, it will suffice that comrades be elected to one, the Office of Treasurer, Comrade Eileen. Two, the Office of Vice Chairman, Comrade Herb. This will, of course, be handled by the diamond seating arrangements. Now, comrades, one last major point. Our reason for infiltrating this committee. Americans seem to have inherited a love for committees for town hall meetings. Such committees can be dangerous to us. So how do we stop these committees? We stop them by stopping the desire for them. We stop the desire for them by exposing committees, this one in particular, to the public as being dishonest organizations created for the purpose of defrauding the public of funds. We destroy the public's confidence in organizing other committees in the future. We will quickly build this committee and its chairman to a point of prominence in the public eye then we will expose the committee and the chairman as being dishonest and guilty of the use of committee funds for personal gain. Comrade Eileen, you as treasurer will work closely with Comrade Herb to accomplish this. Comrade Herb, as vice chairman and Ed Hughes, personal friend alike, you will have many opportunities for deep infiltration. Remember, comrade, on you the success or failure of our entire plan will hinge. You understand? Yeah, I understand. My good friends, I deeply appreciate your unanimous vote in electing me to the office of chairman. Knowing full well that your vote is not a personal vote for me, but a vote for the objectives of this committee recently outlined. And I will do everything in my power to accomplish those objectives. <laughs> Nominations are now in order for the office of vice chairman. I nominate our good friend and neighbor, Herb Philbrick. Mr. Chairman, I second the nomination. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you your new committee officers. Miss Eileen Dayton, treasurer. <laughs> Mr. William Freeman, Secretary, and last but not least, the man responsible for seeing that I do the right thing, a man I know will serve you well, your Vice Chairman, Herb Philbrick. The job, my friends, is a community job. That means it's every man's job. Yeah. 
is the only thing I object to, her. Why do I have to get so much personal publicity out of this? It's the committee we want the public to know about. Isn't there any other way of handling this whole thing? I'm afraid not, Ed. Comrade Herb. Ed Hughes has been watched night and day. He's a methodical comrade. He always does a certain thing at a certain time. At 3.45, an hour from now, his secretary will lay the checks on his desk. Checks which have come in during the day and are to be endorsed. He signs them. Then the secretary makes out the deposit slip and the checks are sent to the bank. You get that check in the pile before he signs them. Just how do I accomplish that? That, my friend, shouldn't be too difficult. Looks like a tight frame, all right. No way out, huh? I don't see any. Well, I guess I better get back to the garage. I'm due in 15 minutes. Henderson. Yeah. What can I do? The comrades want you to, I guess. Don't let this throw you hurt. But they've been gunning for from the start. We've learned a lot. Names and this time methods. Could come in handy. For Ed Hughes. like the way this speech goes, then it's wrong. Your word is good enough for me. Well, I know it's just a draft, of course, Ed, but I don't think it'd be too much trouble to fix it. No trouble at all. The idea is to make the speech good, not see how fast I can write it. Yeah. Now, if you just let me get some of these checks out of the way, well, then we can get down to business. Well, uh, Ed, I, I think we ought to concentrate on this for a minute. No. Hello? Yes? The 21st? Right. Oh, and Miss Racker, will you please hold all my calls? Thank you. Ed, Ed, I think I've got it. Look, there's nothing wrong with the speech itself. It's just the way it's put together. 
Now, what if we started with the conclusions? Wouldn't it be more exciting that way? We'd, we'd catch the listener's interest from the opening gun. Yeah. Sure. You're 100% right. That's exactly what it needs. Herb, I don't know what I'd do without you. What are you going to do tonight, Philbrick? In place of sleep? Comrade Eileen should be at Ed Yu's office right now. She'll call here pretending to call your office. Now, you know what your attitude is supposed to be this morning, comrade? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I give the appearance of standing by Ed Hughes. I, I say that the worst he can be guilty of is negligence. Exactly. Comrade Eileen will say enough on the other side to counterbalance your loyalty. It's just the subtle touch we need. Yes? It's for you, Comrade Philbrick. Yes. Yes. I'll be right over. Comrade Eileen, I'm wanted at the Hughes garage right away. So long. Herb, I can't understand it. Somehow or other, the check that was made out to me personally found its way to my daily business checks. Somehow or other. And I endorsed it unknowingly and sent it to the bank. Do you know what this could mean? Perhaps I can explain it to Mr. Philbrick. Early this morning, I was going over the financial statement I was making out for the committee secretary. I recalled seeing a check for $300 the other day. I couldn't find it on the statement. So she came here, demanding to know if I had pocketed the check. One thing led to another. And we found the check, ended on his duplicate deposit slip. I can't believe it. Ed wouldn't. Of course I wouldn't. You know that and I know it, but what about the others? Take Miss Dayton, for instance. I look guilty to her. And if the newspapers get a hold of this, I'll look very guilty to the public at large. You see what one simple little mistake anywhere along the line can mean? Mistake? Others will use a different word for it, Mr. Hughes. Like the newspapers. Or the district attorney's office. I wouldn't. Why not? Because the check was never deposited. What do you mean, never deposited? No, the bank refused it. It was mutilated, ink smeared. It seems my secretary was filling her fountain pen while she was making out the bank deposit last night. She got ink on the check. I wasn't around, so she decided to send the check through anyhow. It was refused this morning, and my secretary picked it up. I believe the saying is, circumstances alter cases. I can no longer be accusative, Mr. Hughes, since technically nothing has happened. However, I don't apologize for my earlier sentiments. I still don't know how the check got from my desk to yours. Nor do I, and perhaps I never will. Perhaps I'll always think the committee treasurer was lax in her ways to allow an accident like that to occur in the first place. Perhaps you would prefer another in the position of treasurer. Perhaps I would. Sorry to upset you, Herb, by dramatizing this whole thing like this, but I wanted to point out just what the circumstances could have been if that check had gone through. Yeah. Could have been pretty bad all around. Well, I'll, I'll see you at Tuesday night's meeting, huh, Ed? Right. So long. So long. So I guess truth is stranger than fiction. Ink stain saved Ed Hughes' future. Seems awfully hard to believe, doesn't it? Real hard. You haven't by any chance seen Ed Hughes' secretary lately, have you? Hmm? I said... I said it's a lovely day, isn't it? Yeah, I think I'll walk back to the office. Seems to be about the only exercise I get these days. I'll bet. party's efforts backfired. Ed Hughes and his committee survived, and the comrades' plan of infiltration collapsed. Next week, another story of communist activities. Herbert A. Philbrick, counter-spy. A man who for nine years posed as a member of the Communist Party. Yeah.